Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on guided reading for emergent readers. Um, we are uh, practicing social distancing today, so I'm uh, doing today's webinar from home instead of from the Okapi office, the way I've done the rest. So um, uh, welcome to my office, and this is as much as you're going to see, because I would be way too embarrassed for anybody to see how messy the rest of it looks. Um, so we're here, maybe one of the things I'll get done on this all this time home is getting my office straightened up and clean. Um, but welcome to our session though. So thinking about guided reading for um, emergent readers. So I'm really gearing this to those kindergarten and first graders um, and thinking about the kiddos as they're just getting started. So we'll launch right on in. So one of the things that I need to do is share my screen with you so that you don't see me, you see my PowerPoint. Here and ready to go. So, guide reading lessons with emergent readers, kindergarten and first grade. So, one of the things that you'll need for this session, just as you have for the other sessions, is this uh, reading development chart. So, this gives us an opportunity to um, think about the reading behaviors over the course of time. And we're going to be zooming in on these um, emergent readers today. So in our uh, series so far, we've worked, uh, we've had our sessions that were K-5, where we looked at what it means to collaborate in a small group. Um, we talked a lot about assessments and learners and grouping in our second session, and then learning about supports and challenges in text. So those three webinars are available at the um, this, uh, link that you see at the top. Uh, if you go to myocopy.com or Okapi Educational Publishing, whichever you put, put in, um, and click on Literacy Voices, and then you'll see a webinar tab uh, to the right that'll uh, connect you straight to the webinar series um, of Guided Reading. It also has links there to um, uh, the webinar series on shared reading that I did for kindergarten and first grade. So today's session is going to focus on emergent readers, kindergarten uh, and first grade. And as I began putting the session together, one of the things that is um, kind of a result of all the schools closing this week, um, I did not have all of my permission slips signed and so I'm going to be getting those together. But what that means is that we're going to do an, an additional webinar kids from the start. So we're going to call it from the start first lessons with our youngest learners. And we'll zoom in on those early emergent readers, those kiddos at the very beginning of coming into kindergarten. Um, so that's gonna be a separate session. Today's gonna look at kindergartners who are a little bit farther along in their um, reading development um, because we've got K-1. So that's what we'll zoom in on today, but just know there's gonna be a, a separate session. We'll send a, an email link to all of you that lets you know when that session um, will be available. So today in our session, what we're going to think about is what guided reading looks like. So thinking about lesson design and the components of a guided reading lesson. We'll also think about facilitation. So what's the teacher's role? Uh, what's the student's role as well during each of the um, big sections of a guided reading lesson? And then we'll be thinking about what happens after we read the book. So what, what occurs once we've uh, used a text in guided reading um, for the kids? So coming back to that definition of guided reading that we began with in our first session, thinking about guided reading being students with the support of the teacher, reading, thinking, and talking their way purposefully through a text, and then thinking about how students are using strategies that they already know in an unfamiliar text, doing that work independently with success. So with those two ideas in mind, we'll be thinking today about students who are working within this early emergent and emergent um, categories or reading stages um, within the, uh, the work that we do. And just thinking about that, um, when we talk about reading behaviors, just a couple of, of definitions. A lot of times people want to think about what's the strategy use, what's the skill use, and how do you do all of that in guided reading. So I think about reading behaviors um, and going back to the definitions we used in our session on um, uh, assessments and learners, that reading behaviors are evidence of strategy use and that skills are embedded within strategy use. So what we see here are reading behaviors that children would be exhibiting um, when they are in these stages. And then when we look at our text, those texts are supporting our students to develop that. Uh, those reading behaviors. So the construction of the way that these texts are put together really supports those reading behaviors. So when we think about these early emergent level A's, 
you know, here we have a very strong picture text match um, that's designed to support kids as they are, um, uh, you know, being able to talk about the text. Um, so that clear picture text match uh, supports that. But it also, if you if you take a look at the way this page is even constructed, we have the cat that is the, you know, the one word that is the unknown word in the sentence or the new word in the sentence. But we've also got some context over in the other photograph of the little girl holding the cat in the basket. So one of the things that those contexts do is give us a space for discussion. Um, and then when we think about, um, you know, using those, those photographs and pictures to support for problem solving the unknown words. Again, one of the things that we know is that our kids have to talk not about the words, but about all of the suggested ideas that come through those photographs. Um, in level A, we're also going to be thinking a lot about um, patterns, so recognizing the pattern and the syntax and uh, using the syntactic system to support meaning. Um, in level B, you begin to see multiple lines of text uh, as well. But I've, put, I've created a slide that shows you these two side by side because I think one of the things that's really important to think about is that as kids move across these two levels, one of the things that we're working to become very um, consistent with is that one-to-one -one match. Um, and so the words in level A and level B um, have really large spaces between them, again, supporting the development of that one-to-one -one match. Um, you'll even see in level B, those, there's a big space between the lines as well. And that really supports kids as they are working towards using one-to-one um, -one match to support their meaning making. Um, and then one of the things that begins to happen in these books as well, we're supporting kids to learn to use um, getting letters, getting sounds, and things. So, they're able to think about um, uh, the, uh, the meaning that they're making, but applying that initial letter information um, that will support them as they are beginning to confirm and, and, and notice what they read. One of the things I also notice is that, um, you know, there's a real intention behind the way that these books are constructed because we want kids to be able to use those high frequency, uh, or excuse me, the, um, those initial letters that have, um, really strong consonant sounds like rooster and pig and cat. And so that gives the kids that opportunity to use that information. Um, and then level B also is supporting the development of return sweep um, by giving the kids the two lines of text. And then level C, these emergent readers, we see books like My Horse, which supports kids as they are um, uh, beginning to have to rely on more of the, of the vocabulary in the text, more of the high frequency words, because alongside the development of this work in guided reading has been shared reading, our phonics work and our high frequency word development and all of that work so that, it, it, that kids are able to use more than just the pictures, because in level C, um, you'll see that it doesn't give you exactly what the text says. And so, there's, they're also going to have more extensive language um, structures to have to cope with in this text. And so that gives the kids the opportunity to apply more of the graphophonic information. Level D, you'll see like in Little Monkey's Dance, you know, here in these books, we see that we're not patterned anymore. You know, we're not really thinking so much about um, using the pattern and you begin to see a true storyline develop. So one of the things that happens when you get into these two levels is that we're supporting kids to monitor. So that reading development of monitoring for making sense. And so the photographs have that support. Um, it, it supports them to predict and confirm storyline, but they have to use a lot of the text um, that's there. These are the levels as well where you begin to see um, if children are um, you know, struggling with that language system. Um, you know, for example, English learners, they may find, you may find that kids begin to stall a little bit in these levels because of the variety of sentence structures that they have to cope with. Um, we're also having to do a lot more work with, um, you know, high frequency words and using them in a variety of contexts. And so you begin to see a lot of different sentence structures. And then using the initial as well as the final letters in, a, in the words to support. So you see words like look, looked, looking, so that the kids are having to use um, more graphophonic information. One of the challenges that begins to develop as kids are in C and D is um, in A and B, our work was really taking them to print, getting them to use 
the print that's there in the text and then suddenly they can read lots of words sometimes at level C and D and you'll have kids that that swing over and use so much graphophonic information that they're not necessarily checking for meaning and so one of the things that we know is that learners have to know that all literacy acts involve comprehension so working to make sure that kids are making meaning in all of the text so with all that said, let's think about what guided reading lesson design looks like to support all that reading behavior, all those reading behaviors to develop. So when you think about guided reading, typically there is an introduction section. There's a before reading time. And I think about things um, in an introduction doing several things, um, especially when we're thinking about guided reading that's really incorporating discussion really heavily. So one of the things that we wanna do is think about setting kids up for the talk work. So that would be some collaborative work that we're expecting the kids to do. Um, we also, in the introduction, want to set up the reading work. Um, one of the things we don't want to do, though, is be so specific and do, a, um, I, I personally don't think about doing a lot of problem solving before we get into the text, because if I do too much problem solving, then I really ended up squandering the opportunities for kids to be problem solvers. Um, but during the introduction, the other thing that has to happen is that we want to orient the kids to the ideas that are there in the book. Um, one of the more typical ones that people um, are familiar with is what sometimes is referred to as the picture walk. Um, I think of it more as a book walk because we're not just looking at the pictures, we're also going up and engaging with the words. We might be locating a particular word or, or a vocabulary word and thinking about, you know, seeing it before we necessarily are getting into the text, but that happens in that walking through the text. So I think of it more as a book walk than a picture walk. So then, then after that introduction, then we have sort of that during and after reading, that reading and discussing kind of uh, phase of the lesson where the kids are leading the discussion, the students are reading the text independently, and the teacher's role becomes one of facilitation and checking for understanding. And then finally, there'll be a closure um, on the lesson. This is typically the thing that teachers always share with me that they skip because we're either running late or we're not necessarily, you know, we're not, uh, we kind of forget, we sort of end on that, um, that piece. But one of the things to think about is that a closure on a lesson is one of the components that um, really supports kids to transfer that learning, to transform that learning and, and, and put it into some other work. Um, David Perkins talks about that um, we don't just learn by doing, but we reflect on doing um, that supports us as we're um, trying to take that learning on from other places. So let's watch this, this work in action. So you're going to meet a group of kindergartners that I was working with here at a school in San Diego. Um, and so here are the learners. Um, you have Jonas, um, and Jonas is an English learner. Um, he is quite thoughtful though in the way that he shares his thinking and he's very he is very comfortable sharing his thinking um, in the lesson. Um, we have Madeline next to um, Jonas and he, um, one of the things I notice in the video about myself as a teacher is that I was really very very encouraging of Madeline, Madeline every time she spoke. What happened in the first couple of lessons when I was with this group was that Madeline didn't really participate very much in those lessons. So I was working really hard to get her to participate. And so when she tried to get in the conversation in this lesson, I was really nudging and you know helping her to find her way into that conversation. Um, we have next to her Jerome, who is a confident, really active learner, a really strong thinker. And he is one of the kids who really is, um, very thoughtful about articulating his thinking um, within the group. Um, next to Jerome is Camila, and uh, Camila is also an English learner. She's a very strong thinker. She makes really um, thoughtful connections to understand the text, the connections between her text and the life, and her life. Now, in this group, um, I had just begun doing a little bit of work at their school, and guided reading was new to their school, so. Um, one of the things that we were focusing on was just the structure of guided reading, of handling the books within guided reading and making sure that we were all on the same page um, when we were thinking and talking together. Um, these kids do tend to read out loud and they are still um, tracking with their fingers within the text. So those are some of the things just to know about them. Um, they are very solidly though in this emergent category um, of reading behaviors. 
they are, um, if you go back to the ideas that we talked about with these four sources uh, model of reading from Luke and Freebody, um, just a quick reminder, text decoder is all the decoding work, obviously, that kids are doing. Text participant is all the meaning making. Text users are um, looking at how text, um, the role of text in our, in our world, and then text analysts are looking at how that text is created um, and points of view of authors and uh, that sort of information. So this group of emergent readers, this little group, their text decoding was very strong. These kids had a lot of sight words. Um, they, you know, they noticed um, the text and noticed when their reading wasn't matching the text. They were very firm about that. A lot of high frequency words. They were um, actually quite strong at, de uh, uh, at using the final or beginning and initial letters, but they also were kids that were doing some looking through the word and decoding. So even though they are emergent readers, um, some of the work that they were doing decoding wise was from the early stage as well. They were approximating with some decoding. Um, over in text participant as meaning makers of what they were doing. They were um, really the kind of kids when they opened a book, the first thing they did was begin to point to the words, like their fingers went immediately to begin tracking the print. And so one of the things I was working with them on was to pull back a little bit and begin to search the pictures and use those pictures to help them to talk about the text. So that particular behavior is from the early emergent um, collection of behaviors. And so I'm working to support them to do more of that, to use the pictures to predict and confirm their reading and you know, think about what makes sense and sounds right and looks right. Um, so these kids were strong decoders, but, but meaning was sometimes not always um, the, the thing that they would, were talking a lot about. So some of these behaviors as well, from the early stage that we're thinking about in this lesson is discussing characters, actions, and feelings, because we begin to see these different characters as they interact in our fiction story. All right, so the text you're gonna see them reading is Little Monkey's Dance. Um, in this story, Little Monkey, sits, uh, he wants to play with the big monkeys, but they didn't want to play with him. And so he sits down and sits on the ants and he begins to, um, to have ants all over him, begins to dance and then, or begins to sh try and shake off all, all of those um, ants. And the little, big monkeys see him dancing and think that uh, he looks like he's having fun, so they wanna join him. So here you'll see the kids as they are thinking and talking together about little monkeys dance. Remember yesterday we talked about how important it is to um, make sure that we listen to each other while we're sharing thinking so that we get some ideas from each other and we're getting and when ideas. someone talks, you can talk. Why do you think that would be important? Hands all down. Let, let, let Madeline finish her thought. Because then um, you can't hear them. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to get their idea, would you? Or hear their idea. Yeah. yeah. So, so right, go ahead, hear people that are talking? Uh-huh. Why would it be important that you can hear people oh. when they're talking? To go by one, one by one. Yeah, so we'll just each take turns talking and sharing and thinking. What are you thinking, Dora? So if you talk when somebody's um, talking, you, you got to be quiet because you do, you're oh, okay. disrespecting other people. Oh, and you want to get their ideas and be Have you ever seen the kids outside on the playground and you wanted to go do something they were doing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. What, were, what did you see them doing out there? Did you go play on those big monkey bars? No. And you wanted to, though? Could you go do that, Jerome? Did yes. you see some kids and you wanted to go play what they were playing? Yeah. Yeah? I wanted to jump to the sidewalk. Oh. Now, why did you want to go do that with them on the monkey bars? Because it's fun. What's the fun? Yeah. I can reach the floor. You can when you're on the monkey bars? Me too. Because you're taller? I'm, I love yeah. monkey bars. You do? Yeah. So you wanted to go play with some kids that were doing something bigger. Well, now, this book that I've got here for us today, see this monkey right here? This is Little Monkey. And this is the story of Little Monkey, and he accidentally does something that gets the big monkeys to want to play with him. Deborah. Uh-huh. Oh, I'm seven. You are. Great. So, now, today, one of the things that readers do when they're reading in a book, 
one of the things that they want to do is we want to spend some time, like when we go into our first page, we want to spend some time looking at the pictures first before we read the words, because that's going to get our thinking ready, get us ready to understand the words that are there. <laughs> so today when we look through our book, I we're going to look that. at the pictures first, and then we'll do the reading in the words. Okay? <laughs> so here's your book, Little Monkey's Dance. What do you see on the cover? Okay. So take a look. Remember, we're all on the cover. and we said we were all going to stay together today? Let's so we're on the cover. You want to skip back a little bit and put your book down on the floor? You can. So what do you see on the cover here? Monkey has some antlers. Yes, he does, doesn't he? He adds mm -hmm. like Remember, we're sitting down on our bottom. He adds like monkeys? I don't know. What do you think? Maybe, Maybe so. Maybe. How do you think he feels when those ants have gotten on him? Itchy. Itchy. Oh, and when he, he's itchy. And I take, I take. Look, look at what Madeline's doing. What are you doing over there? Show us what you're doing, Madeline. Why are you doing that? <laughs> You think so? All right. So let's go in. Now let's practice this. Remember, we're all going to be staying on the same the page. Edge, on the, um, I think at the end, on the ash, I couldn't get off the head. You think? All right, I so think, let's all go to this I first page. Have fun, I think. You think you're already Maybe thinking about the end? All right, yep, it's a new book. So let's do a little scrunching it down, smooth it down. All right, so you're on. You're on page two and three, and look what Madeline's doing. She's looking at the picture already. Madeline, tell us what you're saying about the picture again. He's sitting on the ants. Look at oh. that. Oh. Were you wondering why those ants got on him right here? Yes. Yeah. What do you think here? Because he was sitting on the ants. He sat down on the ants, didn't he? And then and the ants crawled on him. Oh. How do you think he feels? Um, itchy, 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 itchy. Itchy. How else do you think? Look at his face. Sad. How do you think he feels about feeling itchy? Sad. Oh, so now we've looked at the picture and it's got us ready to read, got us ready for our thinking. So go up and have a read on page two and page three and see if those words fit with what we thought about the picture. Oh, well, he's sad. Sad. Down. Down. He's sad. Down. Down. Does that fit with what we said when we looked at the picture? You said little monkey was sad. Did we find those words up here? Mm -hmm. And you said he sat down on the ants. And did it tell us that in the words too? Mm -hmm. So the words and the pictures have oh, to go together. It. What are you getting over there, Jamal? So, so if you look at the picture first and, you, and then you read, read the words, it would give you all that. Maybe you think it's not going to be that should be same, but it's going to be the same. So they go together, don't they? I oh. think why that, so he's, how the ants are getting on him. You think that's how Because he, he's he's yeah. about to sit down, but then the ants are getting on top of his feet and they're going. Let's see what he thinks. Let's turn the page and see what he thinks here. Ah. Oh, my goodness. That's All right, now remember, we're looking at the picture first. That's the picture. What do you see going on on the picture the here? On oh, where are they on him? On his face. They're there on his the face. Ant went on Where the else are they? Wings. The leg. On his legs. Where else? On his, on his head. Wings. Yes. All right, so I go. On his ear. Yes. Go have a read here and see if the words match. The picture the that we saw. The went on little monkey down. Did not play with little monkey. Little monkey. Sat down. Now, did you take time to look at the picture? Look at the picture first. Um, so, ants. Because he was dancing and the ants got off, now he can dance. Now he can dance. Uh, do you think he yeah, wanted to play with someone? Remember back at the beginning? Let's take a peek back there. Look at this. Go back to page two and page three. Kind of hold your hand in there at the end. Be careful with our books. We don't I'm putting my finger on it. Yeah, put your finger there. And so now looking back monkey, here. And he's trying yeah. to but remember it. back here? Right here. How, do you, how was little monkey feeling right here? Bad. And this what was the word sad. that they used? Why was he feeling so sad, do you think? Because they didn't let me. Does that make people sad when they don't get to play? Yeah. Oh, so how do you think he's feeling over here? Happy. 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 Why is he feeling happy? Because he 
can't be over here. Because, he because the hands got off and now he can dance. Uh -huh. Let me ask you this. Now, over here at the beginning, mm -hmm. the big monkeys, they did not play with little monkey. <gasps> now, at the end, they want to play with little monkey. Why do you think they changed their minds? <laughs> Because, because he, because, he, was, he, because he was acting funny and, he, and they wanted to dance, that was fun. Can you have look at him, he's trying to be back in the really? team. Yes. I'm sure when you look at the book, that you look at the pictures and think, what am I thinking and noticing in the picture first? That's going to help you get ready for reading and understanding the words. So at this point, if we were together, I would have you stop and talk with your partners about what things you were thinking and noticing in the video. So we're, since we're not together, we're, uh, I'll take you through some of the things that pop to me as I'm watching this. Um, so one of the things about this group, they absolutely so enjoyed every, every text that we read together during our, our couple of different weeks together was just enjoyable. They absolutely love in, uh, reading stories and enjoying the stories. Um, they really easily discuss the story. I mean, they, they really notice they're in this, I begin to see them using the illustrations to predict the story. That's one of the things that I was working with them on was, you know, really looking at the pictures before they went up and, and tackled the words so much. Um, these kids do still read aloud and track with their finger, and that would be one of the things I would put as something that I want to support them uh, to begin to take out of their reading work. I think reading, um, reading in their heads and, and just beginning to um, just read with and track with just their eyes, I think would be really supportive for them. Um, they're, you know, beginning the beginning to explain uh, their thinking using evidence. You know, I'm supporting them with that. With, you know, do you notice it in the? Did it tell us that in the words and all of that kind of, uh, you know, cross checking that for meaning, um, and then inferring about changes in the characters' actions and feelings, thinking about how uh, the little monkey. He wasn't really the one who did all the changing, but the other monkeys um, did a lot of changing through that story. Um, now, one of the things about this group is I think they really aren't yet attending to each other's ideas. They're very much, you know, whatever they're thinking about, that's the conversation. So there's a lot of work that we could do to support them um, in that way. So some of the things that I noticed about myself uh, in that lesson, um, you know, my work is a lot of supporting them uh, with the structure of staying together. Um, they were very, I think, used to having someone who, you know, they had to stay together, but in those, in that case, they weren't necessarily trying to do that independently. And I want to nudge them to, you know, stay together, but for the purpose of attending to each other's ideas and having that conversation. You know, my work in this is facilitating the conversation so that all the kids can find their way in the conversation. Um, as I said, one of the things I noticed for myself is I noticed how much I'm supporting Madeline during this because this was the first time in this lesson that she'd actually really uh, done a lot of participating. Um, and then, you know, as we, we're going to see a, another video a couple of days later um, with them in just a few minutes, and you'll see that um, you hear more from each of the students in that particular lesson. Um, one of the things that I work to do is to use probing questions to extend their thinking um, because I want to take them to really being more elaborate. One of the things I noticed about myself though in this lesson, and I think this is so helpful if you ever videotape yourself teaching, is just watching how many pronouns, <laughs> I use so many pronouns in my questions um, within that lesson. So. One of the things I would want to do is to use more vocabulary um, from the book and more vocabulary, academic uh, vocabulary as well. Um, I am noticed myself really reinforcing that lesson focus of using the illustrations uh, in the book to support our understanding before we read the text, before or before we go up and read the words rather, um, because I think the kids again, it's that balancing um, because these again these kids were so strong in their graphophonic work. Um, one thing I notice about myself is I do need to use more wait time because I think that's one of the things that supports students to make meaning for themselves. So when you think about guided reading structure, um, when you think about in the beginning, one of the things that, that I have to do with them is set up that talk work. So I'm 
setting up that collaboration work um, that I need kids to engage in within the guided reading lesson. Because again, guided, if, if we believe that guided reading is a collaborative meaning making opportunity, then what I have to do is not only support their academic work, but also support their collaborative work as well. So setting up the talk work, setting up the reading work, and then orienting them to the ideas that are there in the book. Then in reading and discussing, when I'm in levels A and B, I do tend to have the kids do the book walk through and then they begin reading the text on their own. In this particular lesson in level C's and D's, once there's really, I think, a lot more um, of work that we're doing as we're building that storyline through, I do more of a talk, read, reflect model um, when I'm in these levels where we will look at a couple of pages, we will talk more about the illustrations, uh, thinking about storyline, have the kids read the text, and then we reflect on what they've read. But throughout all of that, the students have to be the ones leading the discussion. They're reading the text independently. At this point, they're still reading aloud in this group, but my goal would be to take them to beginning to read silently um, in these levels. Um, my work is about facilitating the discussion and then um, checking for understanding as we go along. Then in my closure, a couple of things that I have to do is really reflect on the reading work. What was the meaning that we made and how did we go about that? So that closure of talking to this group of kids about how they use the illustrations to support their meaning. And I just love when Jerome has the aha of, oh, so this is what you mean when you say the pictures and the text go together. Um, so he has that meaning making. And then reflecting on their talk work, we, you don't see that in this particular video clip because I, I didn't edit that in, but reflecting on the talk work at the end is important as well. You know, how do we think and talk together? Um, as we work through. So one of the things that we really have to think a lot about in a guided reading lesson is the role of the teacher um, in facilitating that work. And I go back to this quote that I shared in one of the other webinars from Richard Allington and, and Rachel Gabriel, that conversations with their peers improve comprehension and engagement. Um, and guided reading is the perfect place for that. But it's that supporting the kids to be able to be in conversations that are not focusing on recalling or retelling what they've read, but asking them to think and notice, um, comment on and compare um, to really think about what they've read. So some of the ways that I'm gonna get to that work is through the prompts that I use. So one of the first things is using silence. And I always say uh, in, in PDs that um, I don't, I'll always think of it as wait time because I think waiting is something that can make us impatient. Um, but silence is a place for giving kids time to think. I mean, really offering kids the opportunities and the time to think, which is absolutely crucial, especially if you're working with children who are working in a language that is maybe not their first oral language um, that they have. Um, using a question like, what are you thinking, really invites kids to explain what they think. And a lot of times people will say, oh, that's a very open-ended question, and it is. Um, I tend to think of it as a broad question. So it's a question that is broad. It doesn't have any information in the question. Kids are really good at taking our questions, turning them into statements, handing them back to us, and then we think that kids are making meaning from the text, when in reality what they've made meaning from is the question that the teacher has asked. So what are you thinking doesn't have any information to really shade and color the way that kids are thinking about something. So it gives me a really strong assessment of what the kids are thinking about the text, what they're attending to, and what they may be ignoring in the text. So what are you thinking is, is my kind of go-to question. Um, and then when the kids talk, asking them to expand on that. So saying things like, tell us more, or tell us more about that. And notice it doesn't say tell me more because one of the things is if I say tell me, then the kid is really responding just to me. But it's really about a collaboration with the group. So tell us more about that or say more about that so that we can, we can know more about your thinking. And then we want to probe and think about well, what makes you think that? You know, what, what led you to that thinking? Which is a little bit different than the question what in the text got you thinking that? I always say, what makes you think that gets you 
the kinds of background information. So when the kid says, oh, you know, my mom told me, or I saw it in a movie or, you know, whatever, I want to know that. I want to know kind of where that background uh, was for the kid. Then I can say, well, what in the text got you thinking about that movie or what your mom said about that? So I can, can get to both. I can get the background information, which is one kind of thinking, and then what in the text got you thinking about that uh, is another kind. And then one of the things, again, for that collaboration is asking kids to think about, you know, what they consider about someone else's perspective. You know, what do you think about so-and-so's idea? And then if you say that to kids and you get deer in the headlights because you know that they really didn't attend to each other, then we want to offer them the opportunity to uh, ask that student themselves, what did you think of, you know, can you say that idea again? Because we want to know um, that kids are able to collaborate in those ways and do some of that thinking work together. Because we know that comprehension doesn't take place at one point. It's this process of meaning, and it's not just necessarily in one single lesson either. This can be the kind of meaning that kids are doing across multiple lessons um, uh, with the text, across multiple conversations with the text. So that literal understanding, those interpretive understandings, and then analytical critical. So literal being within the text and what the text says, but then also interpretive, you know, what are some of the ideas that, um, uh, what are you thinking about the ideas that you've gotten from the text? Because what we want to always do and hold in our heads as we go through these lessons is we don't want to do things for the child that they're learning to do for themselves. So the next big question a lot of people ask is, so they've read the book in guided reading, now what do I do? So the most important thing is offering kids the opportunities to reread the books. We have to set our structures up in the classroom so that kids are coming back to these known texts to deepen their understanding. So that could be in a lesson with the teacher. And this is where skill work for me is going to take place. Because if I do a lot of skill work before the lesson, as I said, you can end up squandering opportunities for kids to problem solve. Because kids are not going to necessarily be using just one little bit of skill information. They're going to be using multiple sources of information within the text. But if I'm noticing that something specific is, you know, going awry or kids need a little little challenge with, uh, or challenged by something, I can come back in on a lesson where we reread the book and then we do some additional skill work. The other place that I want to put rereading is, is making sure that kids are keeping the books for independent reading time after they leave the guided reading lesson. One of the big challenges is sometimes as teachers, we take the books and we feel compelled to put them back in the book room or we need them for a different group. And so we, don't offer kids the opportunities to hold on to those books for a week or two so that they can reread and reread. Because while they learn a lot of things in guided reading with us, a lot of the work they're still doing when they leave a guided reading lesson is orchestrating, you know, looking at pictures and, you know, thinking about those words and making their fingers match the words and all of that orchestration of reading work that we know that kids have to get really solid. That comes during the rereading of books during independent reading. So the most important thing you can do is make sure that kids have access to those books that they've read in guided reading um, uh, after the lesson. One of the other things I love to do with kids, especially early emergent readers, is do some innovations on the text. So I'm going to show you a little bit of an innovation or, or show you an innovation that some kids did. Um, uh, I introduced you to um, uh, Caleb. Uh, in our assessment session. And Caleb's Guided Reading Book, we were working with a book, a series of books called uh, About Baby Animals. So the vocabulary starter that a copy has, has a lot of this key vocabulary here. So the kids we, we thought and we talked and we worked with baby animals uh, in, as a vocabulary starter, and they were learning how that babies have different names than the adult of the same animal. So puppy, duckling, and foal were some of the vocabulary words um, that are found in the two books that go along with this. So what can you see um, is a book that asks the kids to uh, think about what animals they see, but it uses a pattern uh, that is, um, I can see a, uh, and then it has the baby animal there. Animal Babies is the uh, paired book with this set, and Animal Babies uses a question, and it says, can you see the, 
and then it has the different baby animals. In the animal babies, we also see the mother, so we're able to do some of that comparison and conversation about the difference between a baby animal and the adult animal. So the kids had had several lessons with these books, um, and so one of the, the ways that I was wrapping this um, collection of books up was having the kids do an innovation, and so they created their own book called Baby Animals, and so here are some of the pages from that text, um, or from their text that they did. So um, this is from um, Abby, and Abby, she we used both the patterns that were in the book. Can you see the, and she chose the puppy, and then it says, I can see a puppy. Um, this is the, these lessons that you'll see that are collected around this are gonna be the ones that are in the, um, uh, the early emergent webinar that I'm gonna develop. Um, here comes Gabriel with, can you see the duckling? I can see the duckling. And then here, Yaretsi's uh, was, can you see the foal? I can see the foal. And so the kids were able to do that, um, that kind of innovation. And then this book goes into their, um, their library. Um, we actually did also share it with the whole class. So everyone got to experience this, um, this writing that the kids had done here together. So one of the things about all of these connected texts is we wanna make sure that we have opportunities for kids to read and think and talk between these texts so that they're able to do some of that work because things that that connected text does is it, it develops greater comprehension on the topic. So there, while students explore similar concepts and vocabulary, it really expands their understanding uh, around that topic. It also develops a range of reading strategies so that as kids are getting into different text types, as they move on in leveled text, um, that's one of the things that connected texts do for them. Um, it also increases their abilities to think about a topic from different perspectives. Um, it gives them the opportunity to uh, write in more authentic ways because what we know as a writer, we know first as a reader. And so the experiences they have with these books and guided reading really provide opportunities to think about their the way, different ways that authors are presenting their ideas, and it supports their language developments because one of the things that we know is that as kids talk over time around the same ideas, they move from an exploratory kind of conversation to presentational kinds of, of language. Um, this is uh, this notion of exploratory to presentational talk is um, Douglas Barnes' research where he talks about that when you're constructing meaning, you are an, uh, talking in ways that is you know, tentative and fragment so that we're trying to figure out what it is that we think. So that's the exploratory phase of talk. Um, and then as they continue to think and talk about a topic, um, kids will, or people will move to a more presentational kind of conversation where once we figured out what we think, then we begin to think about how we're presenting it to different audiences. And so we begin to see kids uh, take on the vocabulary and the academic language and structures that um, will support them as they share their understandings with others. So using connected text is really a way of deepening thinking, um, but it also develops language um, all the way through. So in synthesizing talking about the pair, you saw the video of the kids working with Little Monkey's Dance. So after we used that book, we moved to this text called Let's Do the Monkey Bop, which is a procedural text which teaches kids this dance called the Monkey Bop. And it was quite an active day when we read The Monkey Bob, um, I must say. And so one of the things that connects these two books is this key concept that dancing is a fun activity that brings us together. And so we had a lesson that was dedicated to thinking between the pair. So let's think a little bit and watch a little bit. And I'm gonna apologize right away for my choppy editing for this book because I couldn't get my editing uh, app to do exactly what I wanted it to do. But you're gonna see that we're thinking and talking between the texts here. To do first. Take just a minute and I want you to read both books. You can read either book first. Okay. Now, remember those things that we've said that readers do? They look at the picture first and, and then they'll maybe, they'll maybe they'll match the words. Helps get your brain ready for what you're going to read. So check out those pictures, point to the words, and off you go. Now, monkey bop, you're just reading. You're not going to get up and act it out right now. So off you go. Read both of your books. Let's do the monkey bop. Now, I want you to whisper. Sad, 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 
What is the same in here? Jonas, what did you find here that's the same? Hop and jump, jump and hop, hop and jump and jump and hop. Why do you think that both books, why do you think both books say hop and jump, jump and hop? Jump and hop and jump and hop and hop. Hop and jump, jump and hop. Do you think that's part of both dances? Yeah, but this one is supposed to have a page to have um, do not stop, do not stop like this. Like Does this one have that? Do not stop, do not stop. Oh, what did they do in this one, Camilla? They, this one, they, they didn't stop. They didn't stop. So they did said, they? do not stop, do not stop. Do not stop, do not stop. What did you learn do about stop, dancing? Stop. What did you learn about dancing from these two books? This one, this I like um, this. You like dancing? What do you like about dancing, Jonas? Um, I like dancing because... Because, because there's that thing. Ah, turn, turn, turn your face and put your nose on your knee. Yeah. No, oh. I can do that. Hop and jump, jump and hop. Okay, Mila. Let's do the monkey jump, bop. Hop, jump, hop. It's hop and jump, jump yeah. and hop. Yeah. All right, join me back on the floor. Book, book, book. Let me ask you this. So just leave the books right here. Let me ask you. Why do people like to dance? It, because they, because both people like them. Why do people like to dance, do you think? I um, don't. When you were know. dancing right no. here, you were smiling and laughing. Why were you doing that? Because, because I was so my nose up by you. Were you having fun doing that? Yeah, yeah because it was hard to do this. But could you do it? Sit back down. Could you do it when you try? Yeah. You could, couldn't you? Yeah. I can try to do it. Yeah. You should jump and hop. Hop and hop. Oh, I can do it. Sit back down here for me. Because you can also put your knee right here. You, you can do it. Could. Why are the other All right. Have a seat on the floor. Look at all the I things you learned about dancing and you learned about thinking about this book. And look dance. how you, when you were looking super carefully, you added something to your dance this oh, time. Oh, 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 oh. What was different that we didn't notice in the in the uh, photographs uh -huh. the last time, remember? Look at this. We did not look. Look at this, hop, Jonas. Jump. jump and hop. Did it tell us? With words that you could do this with a partner, or did we just notice it in the illustration? Yeah, we just noticed it. Or in the photograph. We noticed it in the photograph. So sometimes the photographs tell you even more than the words did right here. Wow. So we use the illustrations, we use the photographs to help us know what the words say, but sometimes there's something in the illustration that's not even in the words. Well, I did the book. You've got a super look here. Well, I did take well, All I did the right. book. So in this lesson when they're putting the two books together one of the things that i notice about the kids they're still most comfortable reading aloud and tracking so i just kind of leaned into that just a little bit there and said you know you can go ahead and track with your finger um, but again that's one of those things that that i am going to be thinking about how to take out of that work um, but what i have to do is i continually come back to that idea about notice and naming how the illustrations and the photographs are supportive and in this case, even noticing that they gave us different information. Um, the kids are, one of the things I noticed with this is as they kept reading, once they started getting off of that choral reading, that they actually began to phrase a little bit more. So they were approximating that phrasing. Um, and they're beginning to notice those repetitive patterns in the text, noticing some of the language patterns that are occurring. Um, and one of the things that's challenging sometimes in these initial types of uh, comparisons is that the kids tend to compare at the literal level. So my work is also using probing questions to extend their thinking so that they're not just probing, they're not just comparing at the literal level, but also noticing kind of what, what they're finding in each of the books around the big concepts. Um, and then supporting them to bridge those personal connections to book ideas. You know, noticing that how they were feeling about something um, was also something they could use to help them to think about um, the ideas that were there in that book. 
and so that they're really comparing ideas, not just comparing at the literal level. So all that supports us as all four sources of those of that meaning are really being made because one of the things that we know is that children grow into the intellectual life that surrounds them. If I'm only taking them to words um, and decoding words, then that's what it's going to feel like the intellectual life is supposed to be. So I have to make sure as a, as a teacher that I'm supporting them to think and uh, talk in the biggest ways possible about the text, even when they're in these emergent texts. So any questions that you have, go ahead and I should have reminded you at the beginning, but any questions that you have, go ahead and um, send those in there. There have been two or three that have come through here. So the first one was, do I always do a picture walk? Okay, so the first thing I would think is go ahead and shift our language from picture walk to book walk. And we do some sort of a storyline um, uh, exposure. I mean, I think of that it in that way, that one of the things I want to do is, is use a book walk to support kids with the storyline. Um, I also want to think of it as a time for planting vocabulary and planting. Um, so I need to be using the vocabulary that's there in the text. I need to be, you know, using any language structures that the kids are owning. If we're down in the level A and B books, I need to be using the language that's there. That that language pattern so that kids are hearing that pattern before they, they go to read that pattern later. Um, so there's always some sort of an orientation to the book, but whether or not that is a book walk um, depends on the kids and the text. And I only want to, as well, I only want to take that book walk as far into the text as the kids need for me to support them to own uh, the ideas and information that that's there. So I'm not necessarily, even if I do a book walk, going to take them all the way to the end of the text before I have the kids begin to read. So a second question, um, when do the children stop pointing to words? All right, so when you look at the reading development chart and you're thinking about early emergent kids, our goal with early emergent is to get them to track the words word by word, and the way that they're going to do that is through pointing. So in if the kids are in level A and B books, I want them to be pointing to the words because that's helping us to really make sure that the kids are developing that one-to-one -one match. Once they start moving into that emergent category, um, two things are going to fade out. One is pointing to the words uh, to track, and then the other thing is going to be the voice. So you can think during the um, during that emergent stage when kids are working in level C and D, what will fade out is the voice. What will also fade out is pointing with the finger. Kids will track with just their eyes. They're learning to do that. And that may be, a, be something that you actually have to say specifically. Let me show you how this looks when you read without pointing to the words. And then um, one of the other things that I'm going to think about with the kids is making sure that um, they are, but that they are supported through um, making sure that what they're reading there is making sense to them. Uh, okay, so one last question that came through was if the kids are not reading aloud, because one of the things that happens is when we begin asking kids to read silently, the big fear for us as teachers is that how am I going to know if they were really reading the text? Um, and I defer to David Hornsby on this because he talks about that one of the things that kids will be doing is they will be reading text aloud, but it'll be for a purpose. So when you say to them, so oh, what words in the text helped you know that? So through the discussion and then through them reading evidence to support their thinking, we'll be he hearing kids read text aloud during the, the lesson. Now, one of the things I always ask teachers as well is, you know, why were you needing to hear them read aloud? you may have very specific purposes for having kids read out loud. And so um, I might have, maybe I haven't heard a kid read in a couple of weeks and I'm, you know, going to have them read a text, read, read some of the text to me. So I might ask kids to read different parts of the text to me at some point, um, you know, if I feel like I need to do that and I haven't heard them read. So those are things that you make a decision on. So I always think of it as there's a reason for putting it in. It's not my default mode is always having them read out loud. 
So if there are any other questions that you have, go ahead and send those through. I'll hang out here for a couple of minutes. Just thinking about um, this. I know everybody's thinking a lot about what they're gonna be doing from now for, through who knows how long as we deal with kids being at home. And um, you know, as teachers, I know we, we worry so much when our kids are missing all of this instruction. And I just you know, have to hold in our hearts that um, you know, our families are going to do their best to support the kids um, um, while they're not with us. So um, yeah, so there aren't any more questions. So our next webinar will be um, next week on uh, March 23rd. So that's where we're gonna think about early readers. Um, we may have kindergarten students who are reading in those early stages, levels E, Fs, Gs, Hs. Um, we may have second graders as well who are reading in those. So K1 and 2 will be the focus for the work that we do in our early um, uh, webinar um, here as well. Again, thank you so much for joining us and um, have a really safe and um, um, you know, get a lot of reading done. Teachers is what I always think. This is our great time for reading and thinking and um, we're doing our support. So thank you so much for joining me today and stay safe.